Mark Fennell, and welcome to this special edition of The Report. Today, we delve back through the pages of history to a moment that changed the world. It was dusk on April 4th, 1968, when a shot cracked through the air in Memphis, Tennessee. And in an instant, Martin Luther King Jr. was dead. His was a wonderful life of service, but how did it come to such a violent end on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel? For the answer, you have to trace back to the events that led up to that fateful day. And there's a lot you probably still haven't heard 40 years later. Here's my AFR special report, Murder in Memphis, Timeline to an Assassination. If you were scripting a prelude to a tragedy, then the situation in Memphis in early 1968 was the perfect backdrop. Just like the trolley cars coursing through the city, so was racism. Memphis was ripe with tension. In January, a new mayor had just taken office. Henry Loeb was widely regarded as one of the good old boys and was eager to exert his authority. The mostly white police department was corrupt and many of the officers were on the take. Offset that with a population that was nearly 40% black, many were poor and pressured to stay in their place. But a tide of change was rolling in and behind it were the unlikeliest of the lot, black sanitation workers, the men who picked up the trash. They were overworked and underpaid at less than $2 an hour. No benefits, no rights, no nothing. Taylor Rogers and Joe Warren were two of the many who were forced to work under deplorable circumstances, a job no white worker would do. And that garbage would leak all over your stuff, they had holes in it, the garbage would leak all over you. When you got home in the evenings, you had to take off those clothes to keep from taking maggots in your house. And uh, we didn't have no place to eat lunch. We had to stand up beside the trucks and eat lunch. And it was just some terrible working condition. And, you know, the men were getting tired. When you can't speak up for yourself, uh, and you have to do whatever the boss said do, it make you feel less than a man. The black workers tried to organize and form a union. But there were consequences from white supervisors. It was, we, we, if you catch more, more than five people together, he was going to fight because he know you're talking about a union. 33 men got fired about the union, by talking about the union. John was, was one of them. So 17 of them got back to work. So that's why we named this union Local 1733 because. 33 men got fired, and they were 17 of them get back to work. We were trying to gain some dignity, and we wanted Henry Loeb and everybody to know that we was men. And that's what we did. We took a stand and said we weren't going to go no more until we got some justice. On February 12th, 1,384 black sanitation workers went on strike. Their picket signs read, I am a man. For nearly a month, the trash piled up around the city, and anger boiled from city officials. There were protests from strikers outside City Hall, but inside City Hall, the negotiations went nowhere. You say nothing when you know it to be right. Mr. Chairman. If I insult you by telling the truth. I move we adjourn. If I insult you Second. by speaking and saying that these men have fought for this country, these men have died for this country, and all they're asking for is a little bit of self-respect. It's been moved. If I say if I insult you, brothers, then I will go to heaven insulting you with the last hour all those in of self that I have in my life. Aye. Aye. No Aye. opposed? No. Pressure. Lack of communication, and these men have not been to the mayor's office where this matter will be decided, or an illegal strike or work stoppage, which are unlawful in Tennessee, are simply not the ways to handle a problem. It has been held that all employees of a municipality may not strike for any purpose. On March 5th, 116 striking workers were arrested during a peaceful sit-in at City Hall. And on that same day, it was announced that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was heading to Memphis in support. King saw Memphis as the perfect tie-in to his massive Poor People's Campaign that he was planning for later that same year in Washington. He'd use Memphis as the springboard. On March 18th, King arrives speaks to a crowd of 15,000 people here at Mason Temple. Delighted I am to be in Memphis tonight to 
see you here in such large and enthusiastic numbers. As I came in tonight, I turned around and said to Ralph Abernathy, they really have a great movement here in Memphis. Well, you know, that gave us momentum. We felt good because we knew that we were getting some support from outside. A march and rally was planned for March 22nd, but it was canceled due to a record snowstorm. So it was rescheduled for Thursday, March 28th. The plan was for the marchers to gather here at Claiborne Temple, just south of downtown. And by 8 o'clock in the morning, these streets were already getting crowded. The march was to start at 10 a.m. when King was due to arrive. But King was running late that day. He was flying in from New York. He'd do the march here, and then he was flying right out to Washington. So by the time he arrived here, somewhere between 10.30 and 11 o'clock, there were police helicopters buzzing overhead, and some members in the crowd were already getting agitated. How much was riding on this march? Everything was riding on the march because uh, the union um, representatives were trying to get the, uh, the union recognition for the sanitation workers. Sanitation worker was trying to get uh, to be recognized really as a, just a man. Just a, that's why the sign came, I, I'm a man. And um, all of these were so important because these uh, sanitation workers were, uh, they were treated so terribly bad. Down historic Beale Street they came. By now the crowd was estimated to be as large as 20,000 strong. King and other members of the clergy took the lead in the front. They locked arms and they moved forward. But King was clearly uncomfortable. The crowd was over anxious and getting pushy. At one point, King reportedly said he could be trampled. It wasn't very long after that. Somewhere around 1105, this march fell apart. We heard uh, a great a sound of uh, as a, a gun had fired, a, a bomb had blown off. That sound was young, restless members in the march who had begun smashing windows of storefronts. They were throwing boulders in the plate glass windows. It got rough. It got really rough when the police come in and broke, up, broke, broke it up. And that's when Lowe called the National Guard to us. And when that happened, Excuse the expression, uh, but all hell, all broke, hell loose. broke loose. They start the police who were lined up with tanks on the side. Police lined up almost uh, body to body. They start throwing tear gas in the crowd. One of those bombs fell right down in front of me, and I was on the second line right behind Martin. And uh, of course, it blinded me, and I fell during the melee, and I couldn't get uh, up, up because of the crowd pressing me. Two young high school kids, boys, who had come and walked downtown, they came and saw who, that I was down on the ground. And you're and a police, city council member. City council person. Police kicking me, and they told him who I was. And they said, I don't give a damn who he is. Uh, if you don't get him up and get him out of here, uh, we're going to kill him. By then, King had already been rushed to safety, but hundreds were left bloodied by batons and blinded by the tear gas. A 16-year-old boy was shot to death. The march became a tragedy and a tremendous setback for King and the movement. The demonstration here yesterday was something that I had no part in planning. Uh, if I had had part in planning the march, I think it would have been different. Uh, I was invited here by the leadership uh, to take part, and we came cold. We didn't know all of the factors involved, uh, our intelligence, uh, and we do have ways of uh, having intelligence in the movement, but our intelligence was totally uh, nil. He had been extremely depressed because of the march breaking up. Reverend Samuel Billy Cowles was one of Dr. King's closest friends. And after that march broke up, I mean, he was really depressed. And he kind of worked himself through that depression and that fear. They blamed him, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. But others said the blame for starting the melee was on a young black militant group called the Invaders, who didn't necessarily subscribe to Dr. King's nonviolence movement. Uh, but after the demonstration yesterday, I discovered that things existed which I knew nothing about. 
we are having the problems with uh, uh, many of the young militants who talk in terms of violence. Uh, our method is to communicate with them. You know, it was just a massive breakout of, of, of a large number of people. Some of us might have been involved, some of us might, have, might not have, but that wasn't the point. Charles Cabbage and Kobe Smith were two of the invaders that met with King. They were 23 and 21 years old at the time. I mean, we were the only ones who were organizing around uh, a theme that wasn't strictly nonviolent. You know, so that just automatically made a scapegoat. We were presenting one thing to the people, and we were having other people explain us as something entirely different. We were being explained as hoodlums and criminals to everybody, the police and everybody else, and well, the media, and the some of our time. allies well, were even time, calling see. us angry young men. That yeah, was, well, we were building, we were building political <laughs> organizations. See, we you're were looking involved. at guys who really believe, you know, we're the true Americans. We believed we were patriots. We were trying to keep this thing together. We didn't want anything bad to happen to, to Memphis, Dr. to uh, King, Dr. King, to this country. Members of the black clergy blamed the media, specifically the main newspaper in town, the commercial appeal for what they called a biased slant in its coverage. I think the importance of this point is, of course, that the, that the press or the reports through the press have given the impression again and again that the black leadership involved in this whole struggle is irresponsible. And we're trying to insist again and again that we are probably the most responsible persons in this city because we've tried to call a spade a spade. Well, the feeling in the black community was that the commercial appeal uh, really didn't cover the black community and didn't cover it fairly. Angus McCarran was the Metro editor at the paper. And I always felt like as, a, as the Metro editor, if, you, if you're getting it from both sides, uh, both sides complaining about your coverage, you're being pretty fair. Uh, and we were sure as heck catching it from the white community as well as the black community. And it is difficult to, I mean, you're trying to tell it like it is, and it's not always pleasing to hear the news. The movement was down, but not defeated. King vowed that he'd be back to lead yet another march on April 8th, and said this time it would be successful. up next on murder in memphis we knew that uh, that was the end but uh everybody just went home i guess within their own mind that uh, they said something was going to happen but we never knew it was going to be that tragic and that soon and that soon yes.